yeah, Linux shell. Shell what? Um, Linux shell is something that sounds um, uh, strange when you hear it first, because uh, why shell? What's, what's that all about? Uh, in the end, it's basically uh, a command line interface to the operating system. And uh, usually, nowadays at least, you run this shell in a terminal that allows you to enter commands via a keyboard and uh, where you get to see the output on a screen. It hasn't always been that way. Um, uh, with machines like this one here, uh, that's a replica of a PDP-11, uh, the machine where Unix was basically uh, invented on. Um, the guys at Bell, Bell Labs um, were working on a replacement for the Multix uh, operating system, and that's how Unix uh, then um, was born. They didn't have screens. They did have keyboards, though. The keyboard of a teletype. The same thing that was used to um, transmit messages across long distances, where you type something in, then it gets sent over a wire uh, thousands of kilometers away, then uh, it'll get output to a printer. And that was actually how they developed Unix. Uh, it still boggles my mind how that worked, by only having a printer that not only was slow, but also was very, very loud, uh, and uh, having to wait for stuff to appear on paper to see if what you just did was correct or not. Thankfully, then terminals were uh, invented where you had a screen and a keyboard still directly attached to a central computer in a data center um, via serial lines. You had one or ten or hundreds of these terminals connected to a single computer. And that's when these multi-user operating systems really started to shine. Um, and then, of course, uh, was uh, the advent of the personal computer, where you had the computing resources locally on your desk, uh, or in the beginning maybe under your desk, because the case was still pretty big. Um, and uh, now we are basically, again, working on single-user machines, basically, even though our operating systems like Windows or um, Linux are multi-user capable. Um, most of us are the only users of our own machines. I uh, um, at least I hope you have you don't have to share your work laptop with other colleagues. Okay, so um, that's where the Linux shell comes in. Um, in the beginning, the Unix shell, uh, because it was the interface, the only interface you could talk to a Unix machine. So that answers the question, what is a shell? It's basically uh, software where you type in commands and you can see the effects of these commands on your screen. Now, if you install a modern Linux distribution, you don't get at first this command line interface, usually if things go right. Um, so the question is, why would I use the command line? Isn't that ancient technology? Isn't that um, something uh, we can leave behind us? Well, um, yes and no. Uh, of course, you can use a Linux uh, operating system with the graphical user interface, with GNOME or KDE, or as I do with uh, a tiling window manager like i3. Um, but still, um, people like me and, and many, many developers mostly have terminal windows on their window manager or desktop environment. And that's because the command line is the most direct interface you can have to your operating system. It's the You are talking directly to the operating system um, without any um, user interface elements sitting in between. And this direct connection allows you to do a huge spectrum of things um, many of which there isn't even a graphical representation for. 
Because if you want to have a GUI representation of everything you can do with the uh, operating system, someone has to sit down and design and uh, program a graphical interface for that specific operating system function or feature. And uh, these, uh, there aren't as many graphical um, interfaces and there won't be ever um, a 100% coverage of all the things you can do with your operating system and inside your operating system. Um, so the terminal will always be um, the most extensive uh, way to interact with your operating system. Many things you can only do using the command line interface. It's also the fastest way to interact with the uh, interface because um, you don't have to wait for um, graphical stuff to be um, uh, to be rendered or plotted and uh, you enter your command and ideally you get the result back. Um, and um, it's, it's pretty fast. It's a pretty fast feedback loop, basically. You enter a command, you get the results, and then you take these results and um, go on working with these results, creating more results and so on. Um, so, when you are at the point where you are familiar or even um, versed in command line usage, you will be very, very efficient. And um, I can only um, I can only encourage you to get deeper into these things um, because it'll enable you to be more efficient and uh, uh, better able to orchestrate the stuff that's running on your computer. And I hope that I'll be able to demonstrate that to you during this workshop. There isn't only one shell. Uh, over time, there have been many shell applications that were developed. Um, the first one being the Thompson shell, developed by Ken Thompson, one of the fathers of Unix. Um, so his shell was the first command line interface that uh, he ever developed. And um, uh, of course, there were even shell-like applications before that, not on Unix, because um, Unix was still version 1, um, but on Multix, the previous operating system that I already mentioned. Um, and uh, in particular, there was an application um, demonstrated at least for Multix. I, uh, I'm not sure how, how um, distributed it was. Um, that was called Runcom. And uh, if you happen upon files that uh, end with RC on your Linux system, like, for example, a file called netrc, um, that's still um, a remainder of this runcom application that was uh, developed for Multix. Then we had... Um, other versions of shells uh, like the Mashy shell and the most uh, uh, the first one that was really really popular was the Born shell um, that came with uh, Unix v7 the latest Unix version available for the uh, PDP 11 by the way and uh, I actually have a version of Unix v7 running on this machine even though it's just a replica based on a Raspberry Pi, I can run Unix v7 on that and would be able to demonstrate the original born shell. With BSD Unix, there was also kind of a competition operating system to the um, Bell Labs Unix. Um, and on BSD, we got the C shell that was, as the name implies, um, tightly related to the C programming language. Uh, C Shell was developed by Bill Joy, who is also one of the uh, giants in uh, Unix in the in the Unix world. Um, and uh, the C Shell introduced a lot of things that we are taking for granted nowadays. Things like, for example, CD Path Exeget.io. Then there was the 
Born Shell. Um, that was mostly um, available on commercial uh, Unix systems. I still remember having to deal with the Corn Shell on some customer system. I don't remember if it was an uh, IBM AIX uh, or uh, something different. Uh, and then we have the shells that are uh, common on modern uh, Linux system, most uh, importantly the Born Again shell, uh, short Bash, the C shell and the Fish shell or Fee shell? I have no idea how, how that's pronounced. So yeah, um, if you are talking to a Linux system nowadays, you'll probably be using one of the latter three versions. Again, I've been talking for quite a while now. If you have any questions, if uh, you'd like to share anything, if I'm uh, skipping over anything or missing anything, please pop into chat. Oh, look at that. I have to admit that I still haven't tried CD Path yet, um, but uh, looks like it's worth setting it up. At least uh, by the feedback of Division by Zero here. Okay, so how, how do I get a shell on, on my operating system? Well, if you're running Linux or macOS, that's pretty um, easy because it's already built in. Um, with Linux, you will find a terminal application in your uh, desktop environment, or you will be able to launch a terminal application um, in your window manager of choice. I guess if you have set up your own window manager and not a desktop environment, you're already familiar with how to get into a terminal. Um, on macOS, it's basically the same. Uh, in the system utilities for macOS, you'll find the terminal application and you can start that and you'll be in your default shell. By the way, there are also lots of graphical terminal applications that can give you access to a shell in um, the graphical uh, environment. Uh, for Linux, there is a legion of, of terminal applications led by uh, the terminal applications of the desktop environments. KDE has its own terminal. Um, GNOME has its own um, terminal application. And there are independent terminal applications as well. For example, Kitty, which um, uh, uh, whose name harkens back to the teletypes used way back when. Um, the TTY in Kitty is um, basically a hint at that. Um, and uh, the same goes for Alacrity um, with a double T um, uh, at the end. Uh, both uh, very capable and even uh, uh, very capable terminal applications that are even hardware accelerated. And Execute.io asks, glad you're liking it. I should write a blog about that. Yeah, um, uh, one thing that I've started to do uh, recently with my whole community building, um, which I also should mention, uh, is to write down all the topics that I could do a blog post or a video about. And uh, it's uh, pretty surprising once you are uh, a little bit more aware of what, um, uh, how many topics there are you could actually um, uh, write about. Uh, that leaves Windows and uh, Windows uh, did not have a default terminal application, at least not, <coughs> sorry about that. Not uh, up until uh, recently, but I think with current versions of Windows 11, um, Windows Terminal is actually available out of the box. Uh, I'm not sh too sure about that because even though I switched to Windows last year with uh, my main machine, um, I uh, back then I had to install both uh, the Windows system, subsystem for Linux that Exeget.io just um, mentioned here, as well as Windows Terminal, but um, at least both are now available from the um, Windows Store. So if you want to have your 
terminal and your shell on uh, Windows, the Windows subsystem for Linux. And uh, you should actually, as Execute.io hints at, use uh, version 2 of that, the most recent version. Um, the Windows subsystem for Linux gives you a Linux inside of Windows, which is pretty amazing. I really like working with WSL. Um, and uh, the Windows terminal is uh, a very, very decent terminal application where you also have um, uh, lots of possibilities in terms of design, theming, font choice, and all these things. Uh, before, you had to do all kinds of PowerShell in incantations to get that stuff installed. Now it's uh, basically two clicks in the Windows Store. Uh, both applications are available for free and it'll take you about 20 minutes to get uh, WSL2 installed with, say, Ubuntu Linux and uh, the Windows Terminal as your interface. So, in summary, Happily, uh, all three major operating systems on the market make it very, very easy to get into a shell. Okay, so um, with this uh, preamble done, um, let's get into a few basic shell commands, shall we? coffee maybe it's time to do a little bit of a of a survey um how long have you been using uh linux or um and or the linux shell are you uh would you consider yourself a novice uh an intermediate user or more of an advanced or even expert user um, let us know in chat and uh, so I can see if there are uh, if there is a the whole spectrum or uh, maybe uh, if you shall speed up things a little bit 23 years slackware As I said, I've been using Linux since 1993, and back then, the terminal and shell was the only way to, well, mostly the, the main way to talk to uh, Linux. There were already early window managers nowhere near a desktop environment, uh, uh, desktop environment like GNOME or KDE. Yeah, Exegate.io, we are a bunch of old fogies and grey beards, aren't we? All right, so, um, the first shell command we're going to encounter is cat. And I just recently did a YouTube video on that just to uh, flex my uh, video production muscles. Um, because they need a lot of flexing, to be honest. <laughs> um, and uh, cat is uh, used to both output files and concatenate files. What does that mean, though? Well, um, if you are in the shell like I am here, you can uh, enter the cat command, and then you simply add a file name Um, behind it as an argument and then um, it'll be displayed in your terminal. Arguments are very important. Arguments are basically um, details you want to give the, part, the respective command to, um, to work with. So in this case I am calling the cat command and ask it to um, output the example.txt file. It's a unique system. I know this. Where did my... 
pop up go. Luxan28, thanks for following. Welcome to Full Sack Live. Happy to have you here. Yeah, Slackware 15 just came out. Uh, however, uh, it had um, lots of catching up to do. Okay, so cat, yeah. Um, if you add multiple files to the um, command incantation, so if you mention multiple files in your arguments, for example, if I say cat workshop.txt and then example.txt, then it outputs all these files. So the first row here, Linux shell workshop, comes out of workshop.txt and the rest, as you already could see, um, comes from example.txt. And that's what's meant with concatenating. You can um, list as many files here as you want and they'll all be output one after the other in the order that you gave the arguments. And since we are already on the topic of um, command uh, of file output, um, let's also mention two other tools called head and tail. Other than cat, head and tail will only display the first few lines or the last few lines of a file, respectively. Um, by default, it's 10 lines. So you can, for example, say head example.txt and you'll only get the first 10 lines of this file. And if I do tail example.txt, then I'll get the final 10 lines of the file. Now, what do I do if I uh, want not the first 10 lines, but the first three lines, for example, or say I'd like to only get the, the first paragraph here, so the first two lines of my example file? Well, then we use what's called options. Um, and uh, the head command has an option that's called dash n for the number of lines it is supposed to display. So by doing head dash n followed by a two and then example.txt, I alter the behavior of uh, this command, telling it, I'd like to see the beginning of example.txt, but I um, only want to see the first two lines. Luxan28, you just started to study Unix for a computer science exam. Happy to see this live. Well, happy to have you here. That's awesome. That's exactly, you are exactly the person that I'm doing this uh, workshop for. Not for old fogies like Exeget.io who uh, know everything better, better than me and uh, show off in chat. Um, that's, that's brilliant. So if there's anything that you'd like to know, if there's anything you'd like me to explain um, in elaborate detail, uh, let me know and, and I'm more than happy to do so. So going back to head-n2example.txt, now we have two arguments to this command. First of all, there's the option and options are usually um, uh, you, you can tell that it's an option because it starts with a dash. And uh, this option has also its own argument in the form of this two. And then we have the second argument with the file name um, as before. Uh, 
that's the most um, common way to, to do command options where you have a dash, a single letter, and maybe an optional or mandatory um, value to uh, complete this option. In this case, dash n without any number wouldn't make any sense because um, when you when you start telling cat I want numbers uh, number of rows you need to tell it the number of rows so um, um, we we need to have that um, when we do head dash n ten example dot txt we get the default uh, behavior of the command and I could of course just have let, left out the uh, dash n options com option completely. There's also uh, a second very common way of um, uh, adding options to a command, and that's more for uh, readability reasons. Um, oftentimes, commands either uh, even have um, two ways to uh, choose the same option. One, uh, one the short version with dash n, for example, and um, then the more uh, verbose alternative, where uh, which normally start with two dashes and then a whole word. So um, there might be even um, a an option that um, is a little bit more expressive than dash n, where you basically have to remember what dash n even means. Um, and uh, maybe a more verbose version would help to understand things better. But how do we know um, what uh, options we actually have? Uh, let me just uh, do something here. Yep. Well, luckily there's a command for that. It's called man, and it's used to display manuals to our commands. That has been a very long tradition that um, a command is only complete if you if it comes with a man page, if it comes with a manual. So if you want to know what options head has, and if there is an alternative to dash n that is more expressive, we simply use the man command and um, uh, give the command that we are interested in as an argument. And as you can see, Man pages are structured in a way that make, it, make them easier to digest. They always start with uh, the name of the command, basically the header part of the file. Then there is a synopsis that tells you how to use this command, how this command can be structured. So you can see, uh, after head, you may list um, the options and then you may list files um, that you may but don't have to add options is symbolized by these square brackets. In a man page where there are square brackets in, in the command synopsis, uh, these things are optional. So the options are optional here. And even the files are optional, um, but we'll get to that later. At the moment, we have to uh, submit a file name, otherwise um, the command will not work as we want it to. And then there's the whole description, and this can go for pages and pages. And as you can see here in this relatively short list of options, there is actually a short version of the option, for example, dash n. And then there's the verbose version of the same option, in this case, dash dash lines equals, and then a number. And so instead of dash n2, we could also write dash dash lines equals to. Uh, that will have the same effect, but um, it'll be more readable. 
So if you document commands for a colleague or even for yourself, it might be a good choice to not use the short versions for documentation purposes. I mean, if you are very familiar with the command, you can always then replace the verbose uh, writing um, with the shortened one to, to uh, spare a few, uh, to save a few uh, key presses. But um, uh, yeah, these verbose options make things a little bit easier to read. So let's give this a try. You um, um, leave the man command here by pressing Q for quit. And so if I do head dash dash lines equals to example.txt, we get the same result as with the short version above. And that uh, applies not only to the head command, but to the great majority of shell commands. There are shell commands, and we'll see a few of them later, that don't adhere to this way of um, adding options, but I'd say they are in a, in a minority. Okay, so that's cat, head and tail done. And man, of course. Man is your friend if you want to know how commands work. So we can take a look at the, sorry, cat manual here. As you can see, even cat has a few command line options that you can use. In uh, the case of cat, they are not used very often. But for example, um, the dash n option for cat uh, would have been useful to um, demonstrate to you um, the effect of head and tail um, by first outputting my example file with line numbers and then using head and tail on them. Um, so we can still do that, I guess. Uh, let me first add dash n example.txt so we get the line numbers and um, then we can say head dash two dash n two example.txt and we get the first two lines and uh, if we do tail dash n two example.txt we get the final two lines which are uh, this text line and the um, empty row before it. And as Exegate.io says, there is also an, a hidden uh, option um, for a local installation of CAT that is dash dash knock off shelf um, breakable. Uh, as someone who's visited by the neighbor cat for more hours in the day than she's back at their owners, um, I can confirm. But as we all knew, uh, as we all learned from my cat and bat video, um, cat doesn't even come from the feline animal. It comes from concatenate. Alrighty, um, what's next? Who am I? If you are ever in an identity crisis, who am I will help you to know who you are. In this case, uh, it's GWiz. That's my username on my systems here. Um, and uh, who am I simply outputs your username. Let's take a look if who am I also has additional options. In this case, it doesn't really. Um, there's a help option. It doesn't even have a shortened way. Sometimes dash dash help has the short version of dash h, but it even doesn't. And um, it only displays the help and exits. And then there's the dash dash version. Um, uh, 
option that tells you which version of WhoMI you are using. But yeah, as you can see, there are also commands that are very, very simple that don't even have um, significant options here. Thanks again. Thank you for posting the link to my YouTube video. Um, I really appreciate your help. Who am I is like um, OS's ID. You mean Mac OS's ID? Uh, not exactly. Um, but uh, since we are already talking about it, um, I actually don't think I have ID in my list of commands. And I should add that. Where are my notes? Uh, let me see. Uh, how do I do this? Do I write it to my notes? Yeah, why not? Notes. Add. ID. Command. So yeah, let's. Uh, this is a good place to to take a look at uh, ID. ID. Um, gives you a lot of information and uh, we'll discuss um, many of these details a while later. Um, in this case, um, the first two options might be the ones that I'd like to mention here. Um, ID tells you your user ID with the associated username and your group ID. Let's, let's stick with the user ID though, just to keep things simple at the beginning. So here it tells you your user ID which in my case is 1000, that's always a numeric value, and in uh, parentheses it uh, outputs my username as well, which is identical to the output of who am I. Um, compared to who am I, ID is uh, a lot more useful, not only beca because it gives you all kinds of details here, which we won't discuss at this point, but also because ID has useful uh, command line options where you can select specific um, information that you want to have. So if you are you're only interested in your user ID and not the whole other stuff, uh, then you can simply call it with ID-U or dash dash user and um, you'll only get your user ID. And getting this value um, alone is oftentimes helpful, especially when you do um, command line scripting, which is a topic that we are going to cover later in this workshop. Since there is no command line option in of for ID that outputs the the the. Um, um, the user name. Oh yes, there is dash n gives you the name. Um, so id dash n can print only names or real IDs in default format. What does that mean? Uh, Okay, so I uh, have to add two um, uh, command line options, namely, I'm interested in the user, but not the user ID, but the user name. And now you can see that the output of ID-U-N is the same as um, the output of who am I. So who am I is basically just a shorter version or a more concise version of ID-U-N. Exeget IO makes an excellent point in chat that um, I'd like to uh, spotlight here. Um, oftentimes, you can um, pull all options into a single one by leading with a dash and then using the uh, uh, letters without prefixing each and every of these letters. Um, with a dash. So this, in order to get the same effect as ID-U-N, I can also write ID-UN. 
that's something that doesn't apply to all terminal commands, unfortunately. Um, our shell environment and uh, all these commands aren't consistent to 100%. Um, but uh, it's worth a try if it's uh, um, uh, if it's uh, possible to uh, contract uh, your command line options basically to a single multi option. Why isn't this stuff consistent? Well, history, time. Linux is uh, about. Uh, 30 years old? Yeah, it's isn't it exactly 30 years old this year or last year? Last year, go. Um, last year Linux uh, was 30 years old, I think, yeah. Um, 1991, right. So um, there's 30 years of people developing command line commands here, software for the command line. And most people, but not everyone, uh, adhered to these standards. The same uh, applies all the more if you if we add another uh, twenty years to the timeline to the beginning to the birth of Unix, um, which was about 1970, 1971. Uh, no, 1969, I think. Um, and uh, so that's a huge time span and of course not everyone built their commands in the same consistent way but uh, fortunately most people did okay so that's who am i and id and uh, now let's go to something a little bit more useful than who am i which is the date command. The date command, as the name implies, gives you the date. So let's try it um, in uh, without any options. As you can see, it outputs um, the date in a very um, extensive way. It tells you the, the day of the week, the month, the day in the month, and then uh, also the time and the year and the time is in a format that uh, depends on your location in my case it uh, outputs time in the gmt time zone that applies to uh, ireland where i live and england uh, or great britain um your mileage may and will of course vary uh, and you can choose the, the time zone um, normally during the installation of your operating system. You can also change that later, uh, but we'll not go into that now. Now, let's take a look at the man page for date. This is a very, very long man page, and uh, you can um, page through this manual by simply pressing the space key here, and it'll... Um, Go page by page. You can also use your cursor keys to uh, go line by line and your page up, page down keys should work as well. So, um, most of that stuff, most of these um, command line um, options um, are centered on the format that date uses to output its information. For example, um, if I want to see the current time in the most useful time zone there is, which is the um, Universal Coordinated Time Time Zone, UTC, I can say um, date-u, which is, uh, by coincidence, still my local time. Um, because uh, during winter, GMT is the same as UTC. Why is UTC the most useful time zone? Well, um, first of all, it's the um, uh, 
what you would call it, it's a standard time zone um, where uh, in which uh, time is um, measured, I think. And second, um, it doesn't have any daylight savings time jumps. And uh, that's why I would uh, recommend running systems where time has to be really reliable. For example, any kind of server in the UTC time zone, or at least run the system clock of this server uh, in UTC, so it'll never skip forward or backwards by an hour um, at arbitrary times during the year. I still remember getting into hot water in, in a previous job where I was responsible, among other things, for the billing system. When um, at a specific day in fall, invoices didn't go out. We had to send invoices every day and we had automated that using a cron job that ran at night. And the system um, worked many, many hours to send out invoices. And on that particular day, um, I got a call by a very panicked uh, business executive because none of our thousands of invoices went out that day. And that was because we didn't run this machine in UTC, but in local time. And we had scheduled this billing job for two o'clock at night. And that's exactly when uh, uh, daylight savings time kicked in and the clock of this machine jumped from no, wait, it was even, uh, it was, the, the problem was even uh, worse. We sent out all invoices twice. Because in fall, fall back, spring forward, fall back, you get to see 2 a.m. twice. That's why we don't want to deal with all that stuff um, by running your system clocks in UTC. You can still um, display your time in whatever time zone you like, and uh, your operating system is clever enough to do the necessary calculations, but do not run your system clock in anything else than UTC. Unfortunately, Windows doesn't still doesn't allow you to do that, um, but Linux does, so if you're running a Linux machine, it's... Uh, really, really smart to run the system clock in UTC and just keep it running and running and running and uh, make it the task of the operating system to uh, um, to translate that into your local time zone. Well, um, if the date format that I'd like to see that I'd like to see is different from what I uh, get by default, um, I can do so, and uh, there is a command line option. Dash, capital I, or um, verbose, ISO 8601. Um, that outputs the date in ISO 06. 8601 format, which is a format that uh, is unambiguous. I'm looking at you, Americans, um, in terms of what is the month, what is the day, what is the year. So if I say dash I, I get the year in the format year dash month dash day. That's a international standard that ends uh, ISO 8601. And uh, what's even uh, more important than uh, not misreading uh, the date 
if you uh, have the details in this order, you can actually alphabetically or numerically sort dates correctly. Because 2021 will come before 2022. Within 2022, 02 will, become, will come for before 01. And uh, 2022, 02, 04 will come before 2022, 02, 05. So, um, uh, the ISO format is very, very um, efficient and versatile here. If you want to have your own custom format, Date can do that as well. In this case, you use the dash D option followed by a string, followed by a uh, uh, series of letters and uh, uh, symbols that define what you want to see where. And uh, these symbols are, desc de are described here, are explained here in the man page. There are uh, placeholders for, say, the day of month, that's percent uh, lowercase d. Um, there is a placeholder for, say, scroll, 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 um, the year, which is percent capital Y. And that way you can um, build your own date representation. So, for example, if I want to get the date in ISO format, but I want to make it more elaborate, then I can actually say date dash F um, percent capital Y percent M dash percent lowercase d. Oh, wait, it's not dash F. Uh, I was misled by the man command here. That's if I want to display a different date than the current date and time. Um, I know which uh, option to use, and that's not described. Okay, that's not explained in this list of options. It's actually uh, explained up here in the synopsis. Um, and that is plus format. I thought, see, I'm, I'm used to the plus, um, uh, the plus option here, but I thought there would also be um, a letter-based uh, alternative to that, and that's why I was trying something else. I should have tried plus from the start, but I didn't see it up there. So, um, the correct way to do this is date and then plus, followed by the uh, format description. Right, I need the dash as well. So that gives us the same information as, um, uh, as uh, the dash capital I option does, but we, of course we can change things. By um, let me look up um, the different uh, placeholders here. I want the day of month as a word, and that is. Um, Where is it? Here, uh, dash capital A, uh, percent capital A, full weekday name. 
and percent capital B is the full month name. And uh, oh, just for the fun of it, let's use percent J here, the day of the year. So we could say it is, yes, you can also use uh, normal text that will not get lost, it uh, simply uh, is output as it is. It is um, percent %a the uh, day percent %j of the year percent %y. Missed the plus sign. And now we are running into a different issue. And that's a good point to um, give you a little bit more insight into how arguments work. The plus argument is a single argument that defines the um, format I want to see my date in or time in. And arguments on a command line are separated by space, by spaces, white space. So in this case, I've not given date one argument. I actually gave it plus it as the first argument, followed by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight other arguments. And that's why date um, complains, well, I could follow until plus it, but then you gave me a second argument of is or is, and I don't know what that is. Which means, somehow, even though there are spaces in this argument, we need to tell the shell that it's a single argument. And the best way to do that is to enclose everything in single quotes. By enclosing this whole thing in single quotes, the uh, spaces in between do not indicate another option. Um, they are part of the first argument here. And now um, we get what I wanted to get. It is Friday, day 35 of the year 2022. God, we are already in day 35 of this year. It's basically, 10% of the year already done. Let me um, also um, get into what Exeget.io mentioned in chat. Uh, if you are inside a man page, you cannot only um, navigate the page with your cursor keys, your page down, page up keys. You can also search for stuff um, by pressing the slash key, which then um, opens a prompt at the bottom where you can enter your search um, keyword, for example, format. And if you press enter, it'll highlight all, uh, all places where there is format and then you can use the N key to get to the next occurrence. So right at the top, we have plus format, and you can see the search is case insensitive. Um, it gets highlighted even though format up there is all caps. Second one is also all caps, and then we have uh, the lowercase formats here. It even shows me information, um, and uh, so uh, we'll we'll probably get a little bit more than we bargained for, but it's not that's not much, uh, much of a problem. Thanks for stopping by Division by Zero. Have a great weekend uh, and uh, get some great rest. Okay, uh, let me make a note.
search in man pages or searching in man pages that's uh, something i should have mentioned okay okay so um as you can see date is very flexible you can get your date output or time output uh, in in any way you want it you can get your time output in 12 hour format with am and pm or you can get the 24 hour uh, format whatever you like it's all in the man page next let's do a little history lesson History actually shows you your previously entered commands. I'm actually not sure what my command line history is going to display, so I don't, I, I'm not going to demonstrate that. I should have cleared my history. Um, but uh, yeah, if you want to see what uh, uh, commands that you entered earlier, you can use the history command to get insight into that. There is also a way to do this in an interactive way. Most shells offer an interactive search similar to the search that I showed you in the man command earlier. But uh, that uh, is going to have the same effect um, as before. Well, let, let, let me actually take a look at the history command. And that's not the right command here. Okay, history doesn't even have a proper man page. So let's try something different giving history the dash h option. Nope. So I assume history dash dash help doesn't work either. Okay. Well, okay. Let's leave it at mentioning history and um, just to finish up what I was uh, hinting at earlier. If you want to get an interactive um, history search, pressing control and R usually gets you the interactive search where you can search interactively backwards in your command line history. I guess that deserves another note. Well, let's call it command history. something I should have prepared. Okay. Um, I wish there was a clear command for my history so I could demonstrate it. Um, there might even be one, but I'm not uh, aware that there is one. If I'm uh, missing something, please let me know in chat. Uh, other than deleting my my history file i don't think there's a way to clear my my history but there's at least the clear command that uh, clears the screen in your terminal so as you can see my terminal is now full of stuff and by entering clear it all goes away and there is actually um a quicker way to do the same thing in most shells you can configure that yourself and uh, so you can uh, actually configure it to not work but um let's say let's say we uh, have done a little bit of date stuff and so and uh, simply by pressing control l will um clear your screen Slayer Darth, 
an old regular. How are you doing? Welcome to Full Stack Live on this Friday afternoon. How are you? I'm excellent. Um, today I'm trying something new. I'm trying actually teaching on Twitch. We're doing a Linux shell workshop. Which we are going to continue next Friday, by the way. So... You remember that before there were monitors and keyboards, we had um, teletypes with a keyboard for input, but uh, a printer for output. Can you tell what happened when you entered the clear command or sent the control L? Keystroke. That was a page feed, which means the printer would have um, uh, simply skipped to the next page. Um, across the page fold, so you could actually simply rip off the, the tractor feed paper and uh, start a new page. Uh, and that's exactly why it's control L, um, because um, L is the 12th letter in the alphabet, and uh, the ASCII code 12 um, is the page feed or form feed um, character that makes a printer skip to the next start to the start of the next page. So just to give you a little bit of historic insight, why it's uh, Control L of all keystrokes. Slayerdath said in chat, "I know a lot of shell commands, but awk is a mystery to me." Well, you are lucky. We are going to talk about awk. Um, Ock actually uh, got me one of my, my nicknames during my career. Um, uh, uh, at the end of my computer science uh, studies, I did my thesis at a research center together with uh, two students from Nottingham University. And I kept solving their problems using Ock which actually gave me, and they they went and, and gave me the nickname Orc Wizard. And yes, Leodath, um back in the days of teletypes, that was uh, when you had to send a form feed character for the printer to actually advance to the start of the next page. And Exeget.io um, ask, so if you scroll your mouse, you will still see the history? Um, that's possible. Uh, it'll depend on how um, your shell and mouse are integrated. Uh, there's a little bit of configuration you have to do in order to decide, do, do I want to use my scroll wheel to scroll through my command history, or do I want it to scroll the actual terminal uh, window um, and get back to older output? Uh, you can configure it either way. Looks in 28 said, wow, another world. Yes, uh, those were the days. I'm not old enough to have worked with teletypes, um, but let me tell you, these things are effing loud. I, not only are they really, really slow, and it must be very tedious to get your output on paper, having to wait for everything to print, but also the noise that these things made, printing out your stuff. Uh, and uh, I don't imagine that people wear headphones or, or ear protection. Uh, so uh, I don't think it was a very ergonomic workplace either. Slayerdath said, I think there's some history behind why HJKL is used for navigation in Vim 2. Yes, that is correct. Um, uh, that is because, and uh, side note, um, don't get me into 
computer history, um, you'll hold up the whole um, course, me into history, um, um, because I'm all too happy to, to talk about these historic things, because as this thing here indicates, I'm very into historic computing. So what, um, what what's the reason why HJKL is used for navigation in Vim? And um, we'll cover Vim uh, another time, but um, since we are talking about it, um, that's because in the beginning, in, in the early days, keyboards uh, didn't have a standard layout. Uh, every vendor had their own layout. Um, they were probably uh, similar. I don't think anyone used si some something like a an alphabetic order of keys or something. But um, um, some keyboards had more keys than others. Um, and um, the terminal on which Vim was developed in, in the early 70s, or VI, uh, it, the, the predecessor, the, the grandfather of all Vim editors, um, was developed on a terminal where your right hand rested on the H, J, K, and L keys as their home row, uh, not as today on the J, K, L, and semicolon um, uh, keys. At least on the ANSI keyboard, it's J, K, L, and Ö for Germans, for example. Um, so yeah, um, since the developer's hand, right hand, rested on H, J, K, L, it was uh, natural to make them the navigation keys for this editor. Exegetio uh, wrote, sorry, I meant, can you scroll up and see the output before hitting Control L? Can I scroll up and see the output before hitting Control L? Well, in my case, uh, uh, my mouse wheel scrolls the terminal, apparently. Yeah. So I can't really tell. Oh, you mean, can I scroll up and see what has been output before I pressed Control L? Uh, only in a very limited way, apparently. Control L basically breaks the flow of output. So let's see. If I do cat example.com, uh, not example.com, example.txt, and let's do it another time just to fill the screen. And a third time. Now the terminal has scrolled, and I can use my mouse wheel to scroll up. Okay. Now I press Ctrl L, I could as well enter the clear command. And if I scroll now, I can't get back to that uh, output. No, nothing works. So somehow the... Yes. Uh, I guess what happens is my terminal application here has what's called a scroll back buffer. It remembers... Um, a certain amount of uh, lines of output and lets me scroll back to see them. But uh, once I hit Control L or enter the clear command, that not only means clear the screen of any stuff, it also probably means clear the scroll back buffer. So um, that way I can't get that output back without having it stored uh, explicitly, which we are going to get to. Thanks for the compliments, Leia Darth. Uh, yes, um, applications, terminal multiplexes like Screen or Tmux, which we are also going to talk about at the end of this workshop, um, also have a scroll back buffer, uh, which is a little bit more um, capable than the normal terminal uh, scroll back buffer. And uh, you can configure them to have um, a thousand lines of scrollback buffer, buffer or 10,000 lines, whatever you like. Okay. So. At this point, let me um, mention something that I missed in my outline, which I should also write down. 
which is uh, navigating the command line and history. In other words, pointing out the fact that you can press cursor up to get previously entered commands. So I'm going up in my command line history, which is pretty safe since I've entered a lot of commands during this workshop. So I'm going back in my command line history here, or I can use cursor down to um, get back to the present. And uh, once I've entered something, I can also use my cursor keys to make alterations. For example, I could um, prefix this file name with my workshop.txt file name, and then press enter to execute this command, uh, this uh, modified command. So, um, um, cursor up and down guide you through your command line history and cursor left and right allow you to place the cursor in the current command to make modifications. And um, I guess that's something that I should actually have a slide for. And I definitely add one, but now we'll do it verbally. Um, yes, so um, cursor left and right allow you to um, move within a command. And uh, by default, the bash shell, as well as the C shell that I'm using, or Z shell, um, uh, also have um, keystrokes that get me to the beginning of the line, which in this case is Control A and to the end of the line, which is control E. So if I want to get quickly to the start of the command, I simply can press command A and I'm there. Uh, and with command E, I get to the end. Then there is command W to delete a whole word. If I don't want to delete this letter by letter with the backspace key, I can simply press Control w to delete the whole word. And delete uh, Control w again will also delete this one. And now I can enter example.txt alone again. And one more useful keystroke is if I don't want to delete backwards, as the backspace key does, for example, if I'm here on the period, I can delete the E by pressing backspace. But if I want to do, uh, delete the letter on the cursor, the periods, um, then I can use the Control D keystroke. Control D does what the delete key it usually does in a word processor. So just to summarize, control up and down, navigate through the history. As I mentioned before, control R also lets you search within the history. Um, if you want to edit your command, you can use cursor left and right to position the cursor. You can Press Control A to get to the beginning of the command, Control E to get to the end of the command. And uh, you can use either Backspace or Control D to delete stuff within the um, command letter by letter. Or if you want to delete the whole word uh, ahead of the cursor, you can use Control W. These are the most important keystrokes when editing your command line. Exeget I uh, ask in chat, and while we are on the subject of scroll back, less time. Um, no, less time it will be later. Uh, actually, probably not today, since it's uh, half past five here, and I only have about half an hour left. And the next uh, section is going to be um, 
related to the file system. But before I get into that, I need to take a short break, um, repair my voice, and uh, maybe um, do a little bit of stretching. I'll be right back. And I'm back. Just refilled my glass. Unfortunately, it's not actually Bulmer's. Uh, doing this workshop with uh, cider would have probably interesting results. Not sure if they are the results that I would like, but we'll see. Um, it's just water. Hey, quick draw, how are you doing? Welcome back to Full Sack Live. Happy to see you here. All right, let's get in to get to the final lap of today's Linux Shell workshop. And we're talking about the file system. In order to explain all the commands that um, deal with the uh, file system, we'll probably have to talk about um, how the file system on Linux works, at least from a superficial um, point of view. Yes, uh, quick draw, we are talking about coding, or in this case teaching, while intoxicated. Um, it's not illegal, and it makes for funny results, um, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's good form. <laughs> so, file system. Well, Everyone here, I guess, is uh, familiar with how a file system basically looks like. Um, uh, it's usually uh, a tree, a hierarchical um, structure of folders, also known as directories. And these folders or directories then contain our files. So in this example here, I have the root directory symbolized by the slash. And uh, under this root directory, we see four subdirectories etc, usr, home, and var, which can then in turn also um, contain other subdirectories. And that way, this tree branches out and out and out. For example, var might contain the directory log, or home might actually contain the home directories of uh, our users. Oh, sorry about that. Thanks for the hint. Um, I should have switched screens. So as uh, let's let's uh, recap. Um, we have the root directory symbolized by the slash up here. Under this root directory, um, we have uh, directories like Etsy, USR, home, and var, and they in turn can contain directories like log under var here, or we have the home directories of our system users, in this case, Alice and Bob. And Bob might uh, again have subdirectories in his um, home directory um, called documents and pictures. That's how we are used to uh, file systems in any case, regardless if we are using Linux or Windows um, or uh, Mac OS or anything else. Exeget.io um, uh, has spotted the crypto reference and with crypto, uh, he means uh, cryptography, not cryptocurrency. Something I'm not going to talk about ever. Um, so yeah, uh, nothing very special about this. Um, and if I say it's a directory tree, why? Well, you'd have to uh, rotate the diagram here by 180 degrees, turn it on its head, and then you'll have the root at the bottom and branching out, uh, going upwards, and then we'd have, uh, you, you could see better uh, how this analogy works. 
But yeah, we computer scientists talk about trees, even if they are upside down. Okay. However, um, of course, uh, things aren't always that simple. For example, we might have different storage media. What happens uh, if I um, uh, plug in uh, an, a USB stick? What if I connect some kind of a network storage system like the, the one I have back here? My little network, network attached storage. Um, how does that work? And that's where differences um, come up between the different operating systems. Uh, DOS, Microsoft DOS and, and Windows um, chose the representation that each separate storage media gets its own um, drive name. Um, in, in the beginning we had A for the first floppy disk. If you had more money to spend, you had A and B with two floppy disks, which made copying stuff much easier. When uh, the IBM uh, XT came with a built-in hard disk, of all things, um, we also got the drive letter C for the hard disk. And if you were very fortunate and uh, rich, you could even have a, a D drive with another hard disk. Um, imagine that. And uh, to this day, um, Microsoft uses drive letters. Um, you might even have um, the whole alphabet at your disposal. Um, when uh, we had, um, uh, for example, um, in the days when uh, personal computer networks came up with things like Novel Netware, um, we also had drive letters like X, X, Y, and Z um, for network drives. Linux works differently. In Linux, and as it was with uh, Unix before, only has one single file system tree, not multiple ones with the letter A as the uh, root directory of one storage system and the letter Z, C uh, for, for another, uh, completely disparate trees as they are in Windows. Linux has only one file system tree. And how does this work with our USB stick or network drive? Well, there is one important fact you should know about Linux, and that is everything is a file. Almost everything, but uh, it's a nice moniker. Everything is a file, which means that even additional storage media is a file in our one and only file system tree. So you might have your main file system on your hard disk. Here um, it's uh, colored black with your root directory and a few directories below that, among them the media directory. And this media directory now can branch off into different storage media, storage systems. Um, for example, in green, you can see uh, a directory named USB32, which might be a 32 gig USB stick. And on the right, we have another um, subtree here colored in orange, except one arrow that I need to fix, um, which might be our network attached storage. So it's up to the system administrator to decide um, where these different storage media appear. But in the end, they build one big single directory tree. And um, when you navigate this file system 
hierarchy, this file system tree, you might not even notice crossing storage media boundaries. You might go from the root directory to media and down into NAS and down into Plex and you will see a lot of uh, movies and, and TV series episodes there without even noticing that you're not on your local computer anymore, but maybe uh, we are probably on a network attached storage either in the same room or far, far away. And uh, I think this makes the Linux file system very, very powerful because um, users don't have to deal with hardware stuff or um, system administration stuff. They simply navigate a single directory tree and maybe they notice different storage media by their performance. The USB stick might not have a lot of capacity. The NAS connection might be slower than your local disk access, but um, uh, there is no obvious switching directory trees, say, from the C drive to the X drive. And so we get into our shell commands for file system navigation. First of all, we might want to find out where in this big single file system tree we are. And that's where the pwd command comes in, the print working directory command. And that tells me I'm very deep in my directory tree because each node I need to traverse is separated by a slash here, starting with the initial slash signifying the root directory. From this tree root, we go down into home, down into GWiz, then into Dropbox, then into the subdirectory sub documents, writing, Obsative, Course, Linux Shell Workshop, and finally, we are in the examples. Sub, 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 sub directory. Okay. Now, how do we navigate this um, uh, tree? By using the cd command. cd change directory or change working directory allows us to navigate our um, tree. For example, I can go back to my home directory, home gwis, simply by using the cd command and giving it my target directory as an argument. So I say slash home slash gwis. And if I use pwd again, you see I'm in home gwis. That was a nice shortcut if I did this by accident or I quickly want to get back to my previous directory, I can simply enter zd hyphen or dash and I'll be back where I was. As you can see, now I'm back in the examples directory. And if I do another cd dash, I'm back in my home directory again. So I can jump between these two directories, previous and previous, previous, um, by using cd dash. Um, let's go back to my examples directory. How do I get into the Linux shell workshop directory? So the uh, level, uh, one level above where I am. Of course, I could use um, CD Home GWiz Dropbox Documents Writing Obsative Course Linux Shell 
workshop. Oh, I missed an H here, so let's go back with cursor left and simply insert the missing letter. Okay, that works. And because um, I really love my happy hacking keyboard here and its topper switches, um, that was actually pleasant to type, but it takes a lot of time. So uh, there is a shortcut. Um, the dot dot directory um, gets me one level up in from my current working directory. So if I'm now in Linux shell workshop, um, cd dot dot will get me into the course directory. This also works with uh, slashes. So cd dot dot slash dot dot gets me into the parent directory of my current parent directory, which is going to jump from course up to Obsidian up to writing. I can even jump back and forth. Uh, I wouldn't, I, I don't know why I would do this, but I could do this. So uh, basically by doing CD dot dot, which gets me into the documents directory, uh, writing, uh, well, I'll be back where I uh, started from. Um, that's also possible. So I can either enter absolute directory paths, as they are called, by starting with the slash as my root directory and then um, writing out the whole uh, hierarchy, or I can use relative navigation by using the dot dot um, helper directory. Let's call it that. At this point, um, let me point out another um, nice tea of modern uh, Linux shells. Uh, there is what's called tab completion. So if I want to get back to my examples directory, for example, I can actually, um, from writing, I want to go into the Obsative directory. So I can enter Ops and press Tab and the shell will um, complete as much as it can, as long as it's non-ambiguous. And so I can go from Obsative to Course, and then I just enter Lin, and by pressing Tab, I get Linux Shell Workshop. And then I guess a single E should suffice to get into the Examples directory. So uh, the Tab key helps you to get there. And um, if I wonder if there are more directories, I can even enter, uh, press the tab key without even giving um, a hint where I want to go. And uh, by pressing it twice, I get a possible um, uh, completions, which of which there aren't any because there is no subdirectory. So let's go one um, level higher. There is at least one choice here, the examples directory. And if I press tab once, I get two choices. I can go down into slides or I can go down into examples. So let's go back to examples here. And uh, so now I'm back where we started. Let's do one final command before we wrap things up for today. And that's the ls command that lists file system entries. In other words, it lists all the files and directories that I want to see. Um, let's uh, do this like this. So if I want to see which files even are in this examples directory, I can simply enter ls and then I'll see, okay, there are only two files, examples.txt and workshop.txt. And as we've learned today, we can use um, cat to display their contents or um, something like that. 
Now the ls command can give me more information than just the file names. For example, um, I might be interested in the size of these files or uh, when these files were last modified. And uh, that's where the dash L option for ls comes in handy. That's long form. In this case, I get more information about these files. Uh, before the name, we have date information, which actually is the date when these files were modified the last time. Before that is the file size in bytes. So workshop.txt is pretty short, it's just a single line um, and the file has 21 bytes. Example.txt with all its lorem ipsum has a little bit more. It has 879 bytes. And, there, and then there is more um, information, uh, details to which we'll come at a later time. Sometimes, especially when files get bigger, these file sizes in bytes are really, really hard to... Um, are really hard to read because um, when files get bigger, for example, if you have a, a video file, um, getting a size information in the billions of bytes uh, isn't really helpful. So um, in this case, it's useful to use the dash H option for LS, which means make things human readable, which doesn't really change much because we are still in the bytes um, uh, region. There is nothing else to display, but there's a little um, change here, as you can see, what, where before we had total eight, implying that this is uh, kilobytes. There is an actual K here that makes things more explicit here. So um, for some reason, this whole stuff here um, takes eight kilobytes on my file system, even though um, both of these files are less than one kilobyte, but uh, we won't get into this at this time. So, um, let me see. Maybe if we go into my slides directory, which contains actually the um, file information for these slides here, maybe here ls dash l dash dash h uh, is a little bit more helpful. Yep. So let's use the same command without dash h. And you can see here these are in the thousands of bytes. So that's 99,269 bytes. And here we have 115,597 bytes for this PNG file. And uh, ls-l-h gives us this in a more human readable form. That's 97 kilobytes and 113 um, kilobytes. Why isn't it uh, 99k and 115k? That's because these are uh, actual um, Uh, sizes to with uh, uh, they are not counted as a uh, thousand bytes are a kilobyte but a thousand a, a thousand twenty four bytes are one kilobyte you can uh, look that up um, there's a difference between kilobytes and kibi bytes um, which means um, one is to the base of 1000 and the other is to the base of 1024. There's gigabytes and kibi bytes, megabytes and mibi bytes and uh, giga, uh, yeah, gigabytes and gibi bytes. Only slight differences but that, that explains why uh, 115,597 turns into 113k. We didn't lose anything here. And um, as already mentioned, uh, instead of uh, using two separate 
command line options, we can also uh, compress this by uh, pulling them together into dash LH. Same result. Okay, and then of course there are lots of commands that uh, you can use to manage your file system. Create directories, create files, delete stuff, move stuff around or copy stuff. But um, uh, that's for another time because uh, it's uh, six o'clock here and it's time for me to get ready for dinner or even help preparing it. We'll continue this next Friday at the same time, 4 p.m. GMT. Many thanks for uh, watching. If you'd like to continue the conversation in between today and next week, uh, not only will there be probably another live stream, um, I plan to do another coding live stream on Tuesday, but we'll see if that's uh, going to happen. Um, you can also join uh, my newly created DevOps community over on uh, Obsitive.com. You can join for free and uh, we can continue the conversation there. We can, uh, you can answer, uh, you can, yes, you can answer questions there as well. But the main thing is you can ask questions over there and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, and uh, yeah, so I hope to see you again uh, next Friday. Maybe prepare questions if you uh, get some in the meantime. Or I can also take stuff that we've discussed on the community website and add it to my workshop. I'll be more than happy to make it as useful as possible. Uh, I guess that's it for today. So um, I... Thank you for participating, especially for uh, adding value to the whole thing by participating in chat. It's been a lot of fun. To be honest, I was quite nervous um, because that's the f this is the first time that I'm uh, doing actual teaching, um, targeted teaching on stream. I hope um, you enjoyed it and uh, were able to take some value from it. Uh, we'll get deeper into Linux shell usage and uh, command line niceness on Friday next week, 4 p.m. GMT. And uh, yeah, until then, take care.